All right, in this video, we are going to combine some two previous skills. We, we now know how to do a definite integral with that fundamental theorem of calculus. And uh, we also know how to do u substitution. So, so we're going to just merge those two ideas together. We're going to do u sub with some definite integrals. And, and these could actually be done a couple of different ways. I'm going to show you both ways on the first question. Uh, but then I'm only going to work it out kind of my preferred way for all the ensuing ones. Right, but just like with indefinite integrals, a first thing you would need to do is identify that yes, this this is going to require u substitution. You've got the multiplication, and there is no product rule, or you've got a division, there is no quotient rule. But if those chunks are related to each other, if one of them is the derivative of the other, or is only off by a constant, then I can end up creating this new variable u, switch the whole integration over to be in u's, and then it will be something that I can integrate. Okay, so I'm going to switch this all over to u's. And the first step is always define the u. What was the chunk that was causing chain rule? And here for me, that would be the x squared plus 1. So we assign the u. And then the first step is to take the derivative. So in a perfect world, I would have had a 2x dx. I didn't. Uh, all I had was the x dx. So again, you assign the u, take the derivative. This is what you're supposed to have. You look at what you actually do have, and then you can translate it over all that stuff, the x dx. That's all going to translate, and then you have 1 half, and then du. Right, all the stuff that's underlined, that changes into your 1 half du. And then that's all gone. Then I had the u to the third power. Now, what you need to do, the last thing, if you're switching this integration over so that it's entirely defined by the variable u, is you have to switch over the limits, right? When you had this definite integral, you had a, a 1 on the bottom and you had a 2 on the bottom, or sorry, a 2 on the top. Now, that differential, that's really telling you, hey, that's x equals 1 on the bottom, and that's x equals 2. The differential tells you which variable the, the limits for your integration are going to represent which ones you would plug the 1 and the 2 in for. Now, when I switch them over, I now have a u. So I should not have 1 and 2 anymore, right? 1 and 2 were x values. And when your original integration was entirely defined by x, it was OK to have x values. In fact, you should have x values, right? It needs to all be x's. Or when you switch it over, it needs to all be use. So I have to somehow figure out what these corresponding u values for my integral are going to be. But the but the whole key is right here. The the relationship, how you define the u, that, that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the question. What you have to do, if the lower limit for x was 1, just take this 1 and then plug it in. u of 1, uh, you'd have 1 squared plus 1. So if the lower limit for x was 1, if you plug in 1 for the x value, the corresponding u value would be 2. Therefore, your lower limit for your u integration should be 2. And then you would need to do the same thing. The x value of 2 was the initial upper value. Uh, I need to plug it in, plug in the x value for x, 2 squared plus 1. That's going to be 5. So then the corresponding upper limit for your integration in terms of u would be Five. So you have to switch it all. You switch the function over, right? Your u to the third power. You switch the differential. And if you have any extra chunks that, that go with that differential, right? You switch it over. And then you have to switch the limits for your integration as well, right? It should change from all being x's. And now that's u equals 2 and that's u equals 5. It has to switch from all being x's to all being u's. Uh, so make sure you know how to switch it over and get the corresponding u values. It's really easy. Plug in the x for x, uh, and it's that equation that kind of sets the tone for everything. Now I could go through and I could integrate it. Add 1 to the exponent. Divide by that new number. If you have u's, you should still have the u values. Uh, and then here we got uh, 1 8 u to the fourth power. And then what's nice, for indefinite integrals, you always have to reverse substitute, right? You'd have to switch it back, and instead of use, you'd have to switch it back and plug it back in as x's. For definite integrals, you don't have to. For definite integrals, you're going to end up plugging something in. Uh, so if you have u's, but you have u values, you can actually plug in the u values 
for you. You do not need to reverse substitute. Uh, so here I, I integrated, I simplified a little bit. Now I'm just going to plug in uh, the u value. So I'm going to have 5 to the fourth power minus the near lower evaluation 2 to the fourth power. You can take that 1 8th and factor it out, or you could leave the 1 8th distributed and attached to each term. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but I'm going to plug in the u value for u, the upper one first then you subtract the lower evaluation one. Let's see, five to the fourth power, I believe that is 625. Two to the fourth power is 16. 25 minus 16 would be nine. So then this answer ends up being 609 over eight. So that's one way how you can do this type of an integral. You switch it all from x's, you switch it all to u's, and that includes switching the limit for your integration. You switch them over to the u values. It's not hard. You plug in the x for x, right, in this equation right here. That's how you're kind of tying the two variables together. That's how you make the substitution. That's also how you switch the limits over, right? And if you find the u values, you can plug them in for u. Now, there's another way to do this, uh, and that's going to involve finding, uh, actually, it's going to involve reverse substituting. Uh, so, so I'm going to kind of do a second way, and we're going to end up getting the same thing, uh, but I'm going to show you how I typically will do these. Right, uh, the u substitution would set up the same. Everything would switch over the same. Okay, so I'd have one half, two to the fifth, uh, two to five, u to the third du, and then I would still integrate. Uh, but if I wanted to reverse substitute, remember I could have one eighth. And if I reverse substitute, and if I switch it from u to x, I could switch it back to having x squared plus 1. You would need to be careful. You don't have to reverse substitute. If you have the u values, you can plug in the u values for your variable u, and then you can get the answer. But if you want to reverse substitute, you need to make sure that you do not keep the u values, right? 2 and 5, that's u equals 2, and that's u equals 5. You can plug those in for u, and you can have those while your equation, while your step has u's. But as soon as you go back to x's, you should go back to having the x values. And then if you reverse substitute, you can plug in the x values for the variable x. So I'm going to have that 1 8th, just factor it out. Let's plug in the x value. So I'll have 2 squared plus 1. There's my upper evalu evaluation, and then the lower evaluation, 1 squared plus 1. And then here we go, 2 squared plus 1. Uh, 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. So I have 5 to the 4th minus 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. Notice you're going to end up getting the same answer. Here's your 625 minus 9 which is going to end up, oh, sorry, that was a 16, getting ahead of myself. Ooh, that's why I shouldn't do it in pen. Uh, 625 minus 16 ends up giving you a 609, right? And, and that's the same. And they should be, right? Whether you plug in the u values for the variable u, or if you switch it back and plug in the x values for the variable x, you should get the same final singular answer at the end. Now, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's your own personal preference. I like to reverse substitute because for indefinite integrals, remember, you would need to put a plus C and then you would be done. But for indefinite integrals, you must always, 100% of the time, every single time, reverse substitute back to X. Even though when you have a definite integral, there's a way to do it without reverse substituting. You can plug in the u values for you, and that will take you straight to the answer. If you want to reverse substitute, you can. You would just need to remember to switch it back to the, to the x values. Your equation, or whatever you're working with, your expression, it should be all x or it should be all u's. If you plug in, if you would have left this 2 and 5, and if you plug in the 2 and the 5, you would get the wrong answer. If you plug in a u value for x, you're going to get the wrong answer. Or if you had kept it when we did it the first time, if you had kept it with the 1 and the 2, with the 1 and the 2, and if you had plugged in an x value for u, 
you would get the wrong answer. You can plug in the u values for u, or you can plug in the x values for x, but you cannot get them crossed. If you plug in the wrong variable, you're going to get the wrong answer. Uh, and since I like to reverse substitute, there's even kind of a shortcut, right? And I call it the squiggles. If you know you're going to reverse substitute, and you know you're going to end up coming back to x, you know you're going to come back and have the x limits right? Uh, so, so think about it. If I know I'm going to come back and end up plugging in the 1 and the 2, if I'm going to plug in the x limits for x, is there much benefit to finding the u values, right? I have this little 2 and the 5. I have that 2 and the 5. Is there a benefit in finding them? Not really. It's kind of only going to tempt you into making a mistake. It's easy to find the u values, and then switching the back isn't hard, uh, but if you know you're going to reverse substitute, it's, it's really not important to find the u values. So what you could do instead is you'll see a lot of the times these little squiggles. Here, they look like this, little squiggles. And, and those squiggles indicate to me, or they indicate to your AP exam grader, that I know uh, this is a definite integral. If you just drop the, right, when you switch it, you know the 1 and the 2 were x values. So when I switch it all and it's u's, you definitely should not have the 1 and the 2, because those are x's and you shouldn't have the x's with u's. But you shouldn't also just drop them and leave it blank because then it looks like an indefinite integral, right? So I can either find the u values, or I can kind of put these little placeholders, right? And little squiggles represent, I know it's a definite integral, so I know there's supposed to be two numbers here, one for the bottom limit, one for the upper limit. Uh, but since I'm going to reverse substitute, there's not a whole lot of point finding them and switching to them if you're just going to switch back uh, two steps down the road. So the little squiggles are placeholders. They indicate, I know these values are different. It's not the 1 and the 2 anymore when you switch it to use. Uh, but, it, but it's like, hey, I'm not going to bother finding them just to switch them back. Right? So the squiggles, think about them as being placeholders. If you don't like the squiggles, you could do something like this. You could put u of 1, uh, u of 2. Right, so you're basically just putting this as the placeholder. Instead of actually finding out what that value is, or instead of actually figuring out what that value is, if you just wanted to use, hey, it's u of 1 on the bottom, it's u of 2 on the top, use those as placeholders, but then when you switch it back to x, remember, you would come back to the x limits anyways. Uh, so you have a couple of different options. You have some, some variety. You have a couple different ways you could get this answer. If you switch it over and if you find the u limits, you might as well just plug in the u limits for you. Don't plug in the x limits for you, but if you find the u limits, you can plug in the u limits for you. You do not need to reverse substitute. Or, uh, if you know you're going to go back to x, and you know you're going to reverse substitute, that means you're going to have to plug in the original x values for x. And if you know you're going to plug in the x values, there's really not a whole lot of point finding the u ones. The u ones would just be tempting to plug in, right? When you find the two and the uh, when you find the uh, the two and the five, when you find the two and the five, then it's tempting to then take this five and plug it in, take the two and unplug it in, and you would get the wrong answer. But if you know you're going to go back to x, you don't want to do that. Uh, so what you could do instead is put some little placeholder, either the squiggles or this u of one, u of two, u of one, u of two. You could use the squiggles or those u placeholders to indicate that I know these values are different but I'm not going to bother finding them just to switch them back. All right, so either plug in the u limits for u, in which case you don't need to reverse substitute, or if you are going to reverse substitute, put your squiggles, put your placeholders. Uh, it's going to be about the same amount of work either way, right? If you plug in, and if you go back to x's, right? Look, the first thing you do when you plug in, and if you go back to x, you take this 2 value, you plug it in, you do this work. You take the 1 value, you plug it in, you do this work, right? You do the work uh, just the same. Uh, you're either going to do that work right at the beginning, in order to switch the values from the x's to the u's, or if you reverse substitute that work, plugging in the x value for x, that work is going to be done, right? You can either do it at the beginning to switch, and then if you switch it, just plug them in. Uh, or if you reverse substitute, that work is going to be the first thing you do when you plug in the x value for x, right? So it's honestly the same amount of work probably either way. I guess this one technically is a little bit faster because you don't have to reverse substitute. I like reverse substituting because for indefinite integrals, you must. Uh, 
So I like to be consistent, and for definite integrals, I also like to reverse substitute. Uh, so you'll notice most of the time I have the squiggles. If you don't like the squiggles, you can put these little placeholders, or if you don't like those, you can find the U values, but you can actually do them two different ways. Do the U limits, or uh, you can do the X limits. Uh, either way is fine. Okay, but that work's going to be done one way or the other. doesn't really matter when you do it. All right, let's go forth. Uh, and let's let's start doing some of the rest of these. A lot of opportunities for mistakes uh, on these definite integrals. You got to be careful, right? Just check. It's either all u's or it's all x's in every step. You shouldn't ever have any line that's got x's and u's at the same in the same term, right? It's all x's. Then you switch it, and it's all u's. Either plug in the u limits or switch it back to the x limits, uh, and then yeah, you could go from there. Okay, so it's about the same amount of work. I like to reverse substitute, so you're going to see the squiggles uh, pretty much on everything. Okay, here we go. What I would do is assign the u first, 1 plus 2x squared. I would take the derivative to see that it matches, or to see if it matches or not. The derivative of 2x squared would be 4x, then you kick the dx over. I didn't have a 4x, all I had was an x dx. That means I'm going to have to divide by 4 on the right, which means I'm going to also divide by 4 on the left. So here we go. Let's switch it over. Now, I'm going to put the squiggles just because uh, I'm not going to bother finding them. I'm going to put the squiggles, uh, the x dx, right? all this stuff right here. That's going to simplify and, and substitute over into your 1 fourth du. And then you have the square root of that stuff on the bottom. So I could switch it all over to use. Could I find what those values are? Yes. Could I just say u of 0 and u of 2? Should, could I use those as my placeholders and said? Yes. I just like the squiggles. I don't know why. It's just, just how I was taught it. That's how I like to do it. OK, so now let's rewrite it just a little bit. That would be u to the negative 1 half power. Remember, if you drop those squiggles, then it looks like an indefinite integral. Be careful. Do something. Either switch it over, find the u values, or put your placeholders, or put the squiggles. Uh, but if you just drop them, it looks like an indefinite integral. You may put a plus e and stop way too early. Okay, now let's actually do the calculus. Let's integrate. So I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new number. I'm going to reverse substitute 2 and 1 fourth. That's going to be 1 half. When I reverse substitute, I'm going to have a square root of uh, your 1 plus 2x squared. So I just simplified the coefficient, and then I reverse substituted it back. And then as soon as I go back to x's, you should no longer have squiggles. Or as soon as you go back to x's, you shouldn't have u of 0, u of 2, uh, or, or you shouldn't have the u values. As soon as you go back to x's, that step is immediately when you should go back and have the x values, right? It's either all u's with the u value, the placeholder, or the squiggles, or it's all x's with the x values. Okay, now I could plug it in, plug in the 2. Let's see, 2 squared would be 4, 4 times, uh, 2 times 4 would be 8, 1 plus 8 would be 9. If you plug in 0, 0 squared is 0, 2 times 0 is 0, square root of 1 is square root of 1. Okay, so look at that. And then let's see, I've got 1 half, square root of 9 is 3, square root of 1 is 1. So it's going to give you 2 over 2. Ooh, so the answer is 1. How nice. I love it when the answer uh, comes out to be really nice. You're like, Mr. Bell, I would have just guessed 1. Mm, no, you wouldn't. You're a bad guesser. You probably wouldn't have guessed 1. You could think you would, but you probably wouldn't have. Okay, so that is how I will usually do them. Now, if you notice, the u values, if you wanted to have found what the squiggles were, those u values come up. The u values would have been 9, and they would have been 1. Right, so the upper squiggle, if you wanted to, uh, to change them over, the upper squiggle would have been 9. The work that you do immediately when you plug in the upper x value, uh, that, that number that comes as a result, uh, remember, it would be the same thing as plugging it in here. Uh, that upper u value, 9, is going to come up somewhere in your question, and that lower value, the lower squiggle, or that lower placeholder, would have been 1. You can either do that work at the beginning and then switch them, and then if you do so, you could probably write, this would have been 9 and 1, that would have been 9 and 1, that would have been 9 and 1. And if you switch them over, 
you could just plug in the u values for u and it's going to kind of take you to that same answer uh, but if you know you're going to reverse substitute there's not a whole lot of point finding the 9 and the 1 just to switch them back because then you may be tempted right if you accidentally kept the 9 and the 1 if you plugged in 9 if you plugged in 1 you wouldn't get the right answer right so either switch them and then plug in the u values for u or leave them with the squiggles leave them with the placeholders but when you go back to x make sure you plug in the x values right your notation needs to be precise be careful it's either all x's or it's all use. Make sure every single step is consistent. Don't get your wires crossed because it's a really easy way uh, to, to mess these questions up. What's nice though is that these are uh, definite integrals. You could always math nine it. And if you math nine, yep, it's gonna it's gonna give you the right answer. Okay, so so just be careful. A couple different ways to do it. Whichever way makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. Uh, you should just do it that way. I like the squiggles. That's how I was taught it when I was in high school. Uh, and I never had any college professor or any anyone else who ever really gave me any hassle about the squiggles. Probably doing something like uh, u of 2, u of 0, having stuff like u of 2, u of zeros. Probably that's slightly better notation. Right, those, those, that's, that's like a little bit better of a placeholder, right? That's a little bit more formal than the squiggle. Uh, so, so I probably shouldn't teach the squiggles, but I, I like the squiggles, right? Uh, but the squiggles or the placeholders, they're fine. But as soon as you go back to the X's, remember, you shouldn't have the squiggles anymore, or you shouldn't have the, the placeholders anymore. As soon as you go back to X, you need to go back to having the X limits. So be careful. You sub with definite integrals. You have a couple different options, but we should be okay. Okay, let us do uh, the, the next example. I think we only got this one, and then the next page, not too bad. Let's just practice. U would be, for this function, it would be 3x. The derivative of 3x would be 3 and then dx. You've got the dx. Okay, so it's going to kick out a 1 3rd u sub to account for the 3 that's supposed to be there, but is not. Uh, a 1 3rd is going to end up kicking out and being on my original function. So switch it over. The dx is going to be equal to one third, and then du. You have the integration symbol. You can put the squiggles, or you can put the placeholders. U of pi over twelve, u of pi over nine, or you could actually find what those values are. I'm going to put the squiggles because that's my personal preference. And then don't forget to do your calculus. You can integrate it. The integration of a positive sine is a negative cosine. Remember, if you have u's, you should still have squiggles, or you should have the placeholders, or the u values. Uh, and then I'm going to reverse substitute. I'm going to go back to x. And as soon as you go back to x, you should go back to having the x limits. right? So the little squiggles, or the placeholders, uh, or if you want to find the u values, uh, that's fine. A couple different ways to do it. Now I'm going to plug in the x values for x. Uh, so here we go, we got the negative one third. Let's do cosine. Uh, let's see, three times pi over nine is going to be pi over three. Remember, you have your upper evaluation and minus your lower evaluation. Three times pi over 12, three over 12 would reduce to one fourth. Uh, and then here we got negative one third. Let's go look at this unit circle. Pi over 3 would be this angle right here. We go over a little, up a lot. So that cosine value is going to be a 1 half. Those two negatives will cancel. The cosine of pi over 4, uh, that's your root 2 over 2. And then here we go. We've got a negative 1 sixth plus a root 2 over 6. Uh, so you could just write this answer as the root of 2 minus 1 over 6. Okay, again, you could math 9 it to check, and it's going to give you this really ugly decimal, uh, but there you have it. Did you catch what the u values would have been? Yeah, that we did that math, right? As soon as you plug in the x limits, like, what did we do with this? We multiplied it by 3. Well, if you wanted to, you could have just done that, right? Pi over 3 and pi over 4, those are what the upper squiggle and the lower squiggle would have been. This would have been pi over 3, that would have been pi over 4, and then if you had found them, pi over 3, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 4, if you had found the u values, then you would kind of skip the step of reversing back to x and, and switching it back to the x values. This would take you to that same thing. 
right? So you can either do the work at the beginning, switch over the values, and then if you do that, just plug in the U values for U, uh, right? Don't reverse substitute, right? If you have the U values, just plug them in. It kind of skips you. Uh, there's no point finding them just to switch them, just to plug them in again, right? Then you're doing some work twice. I typically like to reverse substitute because remember, for indefinites, you must. So I like to be consistent and I like to go back to X's, which means I know I'm plugging in these for X. So I'm going to do that work, right? I'm going to take this times three. I'm just going to do it after I integrate. Uh, and, and since I know I'm going to reverse substitute, there's really a, not a whole lot of benefit in finding the U values. So either put the squiggles or put the placeholders. But if you want to find the U values and plug them in for U, uh, that, that's fine. That's a perfectly good way to get the answer. All right, let's do the, le the next page and then we will be done with this video. Okay, here I've got sine and cosine. Remember the one that has something happening to it would be your U, so sine of X, not sine cubed. You only have one extra cosine, so your u is just one of the sines. Cosine x dx, that matches perfectly. How wonderful. So I switched it all over, and now I've got uh, the integration from squiggle to squiggle. I could find what those are. It'd be really easy. I just plug in the x value here, get the corresponding u value. Or if I didn't like the squiggles, remember you could put u of 0, u of pi over 6. Uh, that would just be u cubed, wouldn't it? Uh, so you can do either. Uh, that's probably better notation. I just, I just, I don't know. I just, I have a thing for the squiggles. I think they're kind of fun. Uh, anyways, switch them all over. Then I can integrate. And then I'm going to reverse substitute. So I have one fourth sine of x to the fourth power. As soon as you go back to x, remember, no more squiggles, that would be wrong. No more u values, that would be wrong. No more placeholders, that would be wrong. As soon as you go back to x, you need to go back to having the x limits. And then you can plug in the x limits for x. Here we go, one fourth. Then I'm going to have sine of pi over six. And that value is going to get fourth minus, then I need the sine of zero and that value is going to get to the fourth. You guys notice how sometimes sometimes you can leave the constant out in the front, or you could have attached it, I think, on the previous question to just to kind of mess with you guys. I left the one-third in, or you could have just factored out the one-third. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, sometimes I'll do it one way, sometimes I'll do it another. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, and now I need to go get these values, pi over 6. Yep, I'm here on the circle. Pi over 6 is this one where it's over to the right but slightly above. So, so the, the sine value would be the smaller number. So that's going to be 1 half. So I have 1 half to the fourth power minus sine of 0. That's this point. Sine of 0 is 0. That's lovely. So all that ends up canceling. So I have 1 fourth of 1 to the fourth power is 1. 2 to the fourth power is 16. So then this one's going to end up being 1 over 64. Okay, could you math 9 this? Yes, it'd be very easy to math 9 it and get to the answer. If you just math 9 it and if you're purely reliant on the calculator, if you don't know how to do this, you're going to be very much out of luck on the AP exam when you have half of it as being non-calculator questions. In fact, more than half of it is non-calculator, right? So even though I could use the calculator, it's important that you know and you are able to do it without. And if you happen to get a calculator, oh, how lovely, right? It just makes it that much faster, that much easier. Uh, but when you have u sub with definite integrals, you can find the u limits. If you do, plug in the u limits for u. Or if you're like me, if you want to reverse substitute, uh, there's really not a whole lot of benefit finding them. Do you guys see what the numbers would have been? Right? The upper squiggle would have been 1 half. The lower squiggle would have been 0. Uh, so you can find them, and then it kind of skips you a couple of steps. It kind of takes you straight to this point. Uh, but it's just your own personal preference. Do the work at the beginning to switch them, then plug in those u values for u, or just switch it back to x, and then that work is going to be the first thing you do when you plug in the x value for x. All right, two more examples, although the last one has two parts, so it's really more like three. Why do I do this to myself? I don't know. All right, find the area bounded by this graph and the x-axis. That's just easy. That means integrate, right? It even gives us a sketch. I don't know if this is to scale. I don't really care. Here's 0, here's 2, it says find this area, so find the area bounded by that function of the x-axis, that just means integrate, right? So here, this area is going to be the integration of this function, x square root of x squared plus 1, 
what would the limits for that integration be? Well, you're accumulating all those areas of all those rectangles from the left one at 0 all the way to this right one at 2. So that definite integral is what you would need to do, is what you would need to calculate to get the area bounded by that region, or the area of that region bounded by that graph. Uh, let's do the u sub. Here's the u. u would be x squared plus 1. You can tell the derivative of it's not going to match perfectly. The derivative of that would be a 2x. Uh, so since you're missing the 2, you know the u sub is going to end up kicking out a 1 half. But you assign the u, take the derivative. That's what you're supposed to have. Here's what you actually do have, right? Here's what you're supposed to have. Here's actually what you do have. Then whatever you need to do to make it match, you do that same scale factor. Never subtract, right? Don't minus an x. You're either going to multiply or divide to make it match. Do the same thing on the other. Okay, so now I could switch this over. I have 1 half, squiggle to squiggle, and then I have the square root of u, so that's u to the 1 half power. And then once I switch it over, then I could integrate it. Don't forget about that 1 half out in the front. I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, and then divide by that new number. And then I'm going to reverse substitute. Uh, by the way, these 2's will cancel, right? That 2 and that 2, so I have a 1 third. Then I'm going to have my x squared plus 1 reverse substitute to the 3 halves. And then as soon as you go back to x's, you should go back to having the x limits, which were 0. And oh my gosh, and I was off the screen. Oh my gosh, sorry. There we have it. So we, we kind of set up the integral, switched it all over. You had the 1 half du. That's what the, the x and the dx swapped over to. Then you have the square root of this stuff. That's u to the 1 half. Then I put the squiggles, right? And then I reverse substituted. Very good. OK, now let's go through and plug it in. Uh, let's see, plug in 2. 2 squared would be 4. 4 plus 1 would be 5. And then minus the lower evaluation here. I'm going to leave the 1 third attached to everything. You could factor it out, just like what I did. Uh, or you could leave it attached. That's OK. Uh, 0 squared plus 1, that would be 1 uh, to the 3 halves power. 1 to the 3 halves power, that's easy, that's just 1. Now this answer doesn't look very nice, right? You could do 5 cubed, that's uh, 125, and then you'd have the square root. Uh, so you could have that 1 third out in the front, and then if you do 5 cubed, uh, that would be 125, so you have the square root of 125, and then 1 to whatever power is just 1. And that's about as nice as your answer is going to get. Uh, you could write it a couple different ways. Like you could just leave this as 1 third here. Let's kind of get that out of the way. You could leave it as 1 third 5 to the 3 halves minus 1. Like that would be fine. Or you could write it as 1 third. You could do the square root of 5 cubed minus 1. Uh, there's lots of different ways how you could rewrite this. Uh, but it means cube it and then square root it, uh, so you could you could leave it like this. That's probably the way the AP exam would look. Most of the time they give you answers that end up coming out fairly nice. Uh, that one ended up being a little ugly. Oh well. All right, last one, and then we're done for today. Water is being pumped into a tank given by this function r sub t. So that's my rate flow function. This is table of values for r sub t is given. How wonderful. Use data from the table and four subintervals to find a left Riemann sum uh, to approximate. So remember, this is an important conceptual thing. The integration of your rate of change with respect to time, right? If you accumulate the rate over time, that's going to end up giving you your amount of change. The integral of the rate is your amount of change. So when I integrate this rate function, which is gallons per minute, when I integrate that over the course of 20 minutes and I accumulate all those little momentary rates over those 20 minutes, that's going to tell you how much water comes into the tank over those 20 minutes. OK, so let's go for it. This integration, remember the change in water, that is your integration. We are going to approximate it by doing a Riemann sum. It says four intervals, right? So it's going to tell you how many and what type. Uh, let's see, if I've got four intervals, that's going to have to be the first, second, third, and then fourth. So let's look. 0 to 5, that's a width of 5. 
5 to 9, that's a width of, oh, okay, the width of 4. So we do not have universal width, so we're going to have to just do each rectangle uh, individually. Okay, so here we go. The first rectangle, you have a width of 5, and then what number would you use for the height? The one on the left, 14. Okay, the next interval would be 5 to 9, which has a width of 4. Then you would use the y value from the left side as the height. Then the next interval, 9 to 15, that's a width of 6. And you'd be using the 20 for the height. And then the last one is back to a width of 5. And you'd be using the 27 for the height. Remember, you would never use the rightmost number for a left Riemann sum. And then type it all up with the cool little sound effects. And then what you would end up finding is that that change of water is about going to be, if you calculate this up, 397 gallons. Now, this one was nice. It didn't really ask me for anything else. Be careful, though. Sometimes the question will ask how much water comes into the tank. And that's, that's what this would be, right? That's the amount of water that flows uh, into the tank over your time interval 0 to 20, what were the units? Minutes, right? The integral of your rate of change is your amount of change. So that's how much water came in. If it asked you how much is in there at the end, I'd have to take that and add it to what your initial value was. If the tank started empty, then yes, that's your final amount. But if your tank started with, let's say, 50 gallons, then you'd have to add 50 to the answer. The integral of the rate just tells you how much change there's going to be, how much comes in, or if it's an outflow, how much flows out. Uh, this question only asked for the Riemann sum, so it only wanted how much water comes into the tank. But be careful, if they want the final amount, Either take that change and add it to what you started with or subtract it from what you started with. But the, the integral of the rate is just the amount of change. Let's do the same thing for part uh, B, our last one for the day, except uh, it's going to be 4, but now it's from a right Riemann sum. So again, the change in water is that integral of the rate, which we're going to approximate. The widths aren't going to change. It's the same subintervals, right? So the widths of these rectangles are not going to change. What will change are the corresponding heights we use for each one. So let's go through it. The first interval for the right Riemann sum, now the height would be 18. Right, using the number on the right for each interval. Then for the second interval, now the height would be 20, right? It was 18 for the left. Now I'm using the right, so it's 20. Then you'd use 27. Then the last one would be 32, right? You would never use the leftmost number for the right Riemann sum. And then here you would find that that change in water, if you use the right Riemann sum to approximate it, it's going to be about 492 gallons. The integral of the rate tells you your amount of change. This question didn't tell me how much initially there was in the tank, but if it did, you could get a question that asks how much is in there at the end, right? At time equals 20, how much water is in the tank? Take your initial, add this stuff to it. Uh, that looks like it would be an under approximation, right? Since this function is increasing, right? It looks like it's always getting bigger. Uh, it looks like uh, the, the right Riemann sum would be either over approximation, the left would be your under approximation. Alrighty, well there you go. Uh, there, there's your U sub with definite integrals. Really, that one with the Riemann sum had nothing to do with U sub. It was kind of just a little miscellaneous question thrown in there. Uh, but when you're doing a U sub, you can either switch it over and plug in the U limits for U, or if you know you're going to reverse substitute back to X, like I prefer to, because for indefinites, you must always go back to x, then you'd put your plus c and you'd be done. Uh, but since I like to reverse substitute, typically I put the squiggles. If you don't like the squiggles, you could do probably the better notation, which is the u of 1, u of 2, that, what, that u of whatever placeholder. Uh, but either the placeholders or the squiggles, that's what you would need to do. And then as soon as you switch it back to x, you could go back to having the x limits. Is it wrong? If you, if you find the 2 and the 5, is it wrong to have them and then change it back? No. But if you find the 2 and the 5, it's tempting to plug in, right? If you had the 2 and the, the two and the 5, then it's tempting to maybe leave this as 2 
and has 5. And if you plug in the u limits for, for x, you're going to get it wrong. It's not tempting at all to plug in the squiggle. Right, so the squiggle is a reminder that this number is different. So when I switch it back, I need to go back and have the x value. Uh, that's why I like the squiggles, because I know your answer is not going to be squiggle to the fourth power. The squiggle is not tempting to plug in. Whereas if you find the 2 and the 5, it is kind of tempting to forget to switch them back. And if you had the 2 and the 5, you would get the wrong answer. Right, so you, you can kind of do it whichever way you prefer. Find the u values, uh, plug them in for you. Or if you're going to reverse substitute, uh, there's really not a whole lot of point in doing it. Put the squiggles or put the placeholders, or if you want to switch it to the u-values, just make sure you switch it back to the x's. Every step needs to be consistent. It's either all u or it's all x. And if you kind of get that in your memory, it'll help eradicate some of these uh, really silly mistakes.